Next up, we have ourselves a Marine Corps veteran who's currently working on the front lines of Ukraine with his nonprofit. Please welcome Will McNulty. Thank you. 10 days ago, I made a almost catastrophic mistake. I was near the town of Bakhmut in Eastern Ukraine and I flew here, it took me three days to get out. And it was 1 a.m., we were distributing supplies earlier in the day, body armor, individual first aid kits, night vision, to our partners in the Ukrainian military. And we were now sleeping in a not special house, um, nothing of strategic importance, when at 1 a.m. a missile struck nearby, blowing out the windows and cracking the ceilings and the walls. My team quickly went down to the cellar, to the basement, where we did a triage. No one was injured. Um, and we were trying to determine whether or not we would move to another location um, or stay there. We tried to assess why this missile had struck so close to our house, and I asked everyone to pull out their cell phones to ensure that everyone's was on airplane mode, as I had instructed my team days earlier. As we pulled out our cell phone, I noticed that mine was actually not on airplane mode, meaning that Russian signals intelligence systems could register the phone, could see it. We don't know if that was the reason why that missile struck so close to our location that night, but it was an error on my part that came about from operating along the front lines of Ukraine for the last eight months. It was an error of fatigue, of burnout, and even if I'm being honest with myself, depression. So my name is William McNulty. I'm a Marine Corps veteran, currently run a charity in Ukraine called White Stork. Um, by the numbers, we have uh, conducted both evacuations and supply efforts along the front lines. And I've done this alongside my co-founder, Grace Kim. We've evacuated over 37,000 women and children from the safety of Ukraine, from besieged cities in Ukraine into the safety of Poland using an idle network of tourist buses. And we've supplied over 22,000 individual first aid kits to the Ukrainian military with things like tourniquets, Israeli bandages, vented chest seals, things that, they, that I carried on me in the Marine Corps, but that the Ukrainian military was not prepared, was not equipped with when Russia invaded. But why did we stay? Why are we all in in Ukraine? I think that's the important question. About a month into the war, it became clear that there were grim historical echoes emerging that were too familiar to ignore. Over 1,200 schools, churches, museums, hospitals, community centers have been struck with precision guided bombs. We've seen the wholesale deportation of populations deep into Russia. We've seen the use of forced impregnation. We've seen rape, according to the UN, used as a weapon of war. 74 years ago, the greatest generation came up with a word to honor what had happened, to prevent what had happened in Auschwitz, Dachau, and elsewhere. And that was never again. We also invented a new word called genocide to describe the crimes that took place. So, I ask everyone to consider what is taking place in Ukraine because these grim historical echoes are too familiar to ignore. I and my team are all in in preventing this genocide from happening and you can find us at operationwhitestork.org. Thank you very much. Thank you, Will. Let's hear it again for Will. Our third share 
comes from the founder of Lessons from a Lifer, Artie Gonzalez. Thank you. Thank you. In 2010, I had spent the past six years of my life in solitary confinement in a supermax facility in Northern California, the notorious and deadly Pelican Bay State Prison, a byproduct of child abuse, neglect, fatherless. I grew up in a place where your first fist fights occurred on elementary schoolyards. Absolutely no one was surprised when at the age of 16, I was tried as an adult for the taking of a life and I was sentenced to 19 to life. Eventually I would grow and I would become a high level gang member in the state of California, in the prison system. And the administration would remove me from the general population, ironically, for the safety and security of other gang members. It would be a total of eight years before I was released from solitary confinement, 21 years total before gaining actual freedom. But in the meantime, it's 2010, and I'm sitting in what many refer to as the hole. They call it the hole because although the facility sits above ground, one is made to feel as if they're living in an underground bunker windowless cells, no access to direct sunlight, 23 hours a day confined to the cell, and no human contact. This facility was intentionally constructed with sensory deprivation built into the blueprint. This is a place where human beings routinely lost more than just their skin tone. I saw many people, many sane people, lose their grasp of reality in the time that I was there. As a note, the Human Rights Watch defines the use of long-term solitary confinement as torture, pure and simple. And I can tell you from direct lived experience that this is the case, this is fact. I was tortured in this country and the state of California called it rehabilitation. <laughs> in 2010, I was growing increasingly dissatisfied with my life as a gang member. I was now 32 years old, and I had started to mature out of the defective ways of thinking that had contributed to my incarceration early on. I was no longer as impressionable. I saw through the cracks in the facade of the lifestyle I had chosen, and I was actively questioning hypocrisy all around me. I was very unhappy. I was very depressed. And if I'm being entirely honest with everyone here, I just wanted my wasted life to be at an end. I wanted death, but I lacked the courage to take my own life. And so instead, I sat there and I just suffered in silence. As I already mentioned, I had no access to direct sunlight. I didn't actually physically see the sun itself for the, not a single time, for the entire eight years that I was there. That being said, every unit did have a skylight constructed into it. And as we all know with skylights, they do allow muted sunlight to enter and dimly light the interior. One day, I'm sitting on my bunk and I'm eating or reading. I can't clearly recall anymore. And I felt it before I saw it. Warmth on my hand. I looked down. Sunlight, it was direct sunlight. I can't tell you 
how fucking amazing that felt. I don't know if this had been caused by weathering in the skylight or it had been damaged in some way. I, I was in a place that rained 75% of the time. But whatever had happened, it had allowed this beam of light to enter the space and touch me. And I knew that this was not ordinary sunlight. Life itself, spirit, God, the universe, whatever we choose to call it, it was touching me. And every fiber of my being exploded with consciousness. I knew in that moment that I was never meant to be there. I was actually meant to touch this world in positive, life-affirming ways. These hands that had been the cause of so much harm in the world. <laughs> These hands, they were meant to lovingly shape community and people. <laughs> Whatever I chose to do from that moment forward, I knew that I could no longer deny or ignore the spiritual experience I was having that day. And so I didn't. In 2010, I walked away from the gang life forever. My entire identity. I threw myself into deep inner work, much like we are all doing here this weekend. And I set myself on a trajectory toward my highest self, my most balanced self, striving to do the highest good. And I kid you not, in five short years from that day, I went from a life sentence, wanting certain death in that hole, to freedom, to this sunlight. My career path these days is in the film industry, but my spiritual one is here with you today. And I am showing up as a messenger, hoping to inspire your own explosion of consciousness. Whatever you choose to do after this incredible weekend is over, please do not deny or forget the experience, the spiritual experience that we are all sharing here this weekend. In this space, I really believe that you were all meant to be here today. This is not an accident. We were all meant to be here and you were meant to share this moment with me. And in this space, we have the ability to bless one another with the gift and the power of story. This was mine. This was how I found redemption in isolation. Thank you. Thank you, Artie. One more time for all these speakers. And let's just take a moment to drink that all in. It's not surprising I don't have any jokes this time around. So to close this out, head of Summit Impact, Shira Bramowitz. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for being here. Thank you for listening. Thank you for opening your hearts to the stories shared on stage today. Um, I just want to let you know that the speakers, some of them, Artie and Nasreen, are two of our Summit Fellows. Um, Will is a community member who's been at Summit a long time. And please continue to find them and support their work at this event. You know, see how you can continue to uplift them and their stories. Um, you'll notice at the back there's a sign with a little QR code that says, take action. Those are ways to get involved in Summit Impact, support fellows. Um, or you can also visit us in the Impact Lounge, which is right back there. Um, but come and get involved. Continue to share stories. 
Let those stories guide you to more informed action and to being part of a community where we continue to uplift each other, celebrate each other, recognize both the moments of challenge and the moments of triumph, and to move forward together. So thanks, everyone. See you later in the event.